This is Duke University. Welcome back. So uh, taking a page out of the chatter book, we've been monitoring feedback um, in real-time workflow. So we've gone from 60 people on Ustream up to over 150 in the morning session. That's, I think that's positive, right? Um, and the other thing we're hearing is, let's open it up for questions sooner. So the way that we're going to moderate this next panel is I'm going to ask one question just to get the conversation going, and then we're going to open it up. And we've got mic runners here. So get ready with your questions for this one. Because this is the one that really sets or lays the table for the afternoon where we get into the nits and grits of what it really is like to lead and manage inside the context of media and entertainment. So what we're going to do now is um, fire hose media and entertainment. This is like uh, MBA in a microwave on how the industry works, what makes it tick, what the consumer behavior is. Mike uh, is first going to talk about, about consumer behavior stuff. Then we're going to talk about value chain. Then we're going to talk about the future. Where is this in the industry going? And we're doing that in a four-year window, because anything beyond four years is probably risky at this point in time. And PwC kind of does a rolling four-year forecast. So what we hope you'll leave here with before lunch is kind of the basic language and understanding of how to follow the money across the chain, what the consumer behavior type um, is today, and where it's going to go between now and 2014. Okay. So first up, we're going to talk a little consumer behavior. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Oh, your clicker is right here. Sorry. Excellent. Thank you, Tony, and thank you for the chance to be here today. It's a, it's a real pleasure. I should say off the bat, I am not a Fuqua alum. Um, and it, yeah, yeah. Well, it may be, I, I have a chance. It may be heresy. I don't actually have an MBA. So, uh, you know, I look forward to learning from your questions along the way. But, uh, we McKinsey as a firm do have a, a strong and growing relationship with Duke and with Fuqua, and so you know, it's our pleasure to come here and, and share with you some thoughts. Um, having listened this morning to Jonathan, to Polly, and to John, there's a risk as I go through this that I'm going to sound like the reactionary of the group, uh, and the title here, Back to the Future, uh, may serve to underscore that, but I assure you that's not the case. Uh, my purpose here is, is not to deny the revolution, but rather to explain the data uh, and the nuances underlying that revolution. So bear with me for a second if I uh, sound like the Luddite of the group. I wanted to start uh, with a quick straw poll here, and if you guys will oblige me by uh, a show of hands, um, just, to, just to get a little bit of grandmother research here about media consumption behavior. So can you raise your hand? How many of you have a television set in your home today? All right, that's nearly 100%, although I see a couple hands in laps, so let's call that 95. Um, how many of you subscribe to a pay TV service uh, of any type? Okay, a big number, I'm, I'm gonna call that 80, 80 some odd. Uh, how many of you watch TV at least four hours a day? Okay, and you, you, you all uh, win the award for honesty uh, in this group. And in exchange for that, I, I will let you be anonymous. That looked like about 5%. Uh, of the assembled group here today. Two more questions. How many watched this year's Super Bowl? Show of hands. Uh, that's good. I'm glad to see that uh, the MBA course load is not so prohibitive. How many caught this year's Grammys? All right, that, that looks more like 30% of the group. Um, so as we tick through this, right, almost everybody has a television set. 80 some odd percent of you uh, subscribe to a pay TV service. Uh, some five very honest percent of you watch at least four hours a day. Um, and the vast majority of you uh, watch the Super Bowl and, and watch the Grammys. Um, one might be tempted from those findings to conclude uh, that TV you know, remains a powerful force, uh, maybe a little bit of fraying at the edges. I saw some people without a set at home, some people without a paid TV service, uh, but that it's a small indulgence in your lives, right? A couple hours a day at best. Um, and as always with grandmother research, those would be some very dangerous conclusions. So let me just share some more statistics with you. Um, across the country, 98% of households have a television uh, in the home. So we were pretty representative there uh, in terms of the devices. Uh, roughly 90% of people have a pay television service at home. And this is a figure we'll come back to 
uh, and look at in a little bit more detail. I think that was slightly above uh, the average here in the room. 50% uh, of Americans watch at least four hours a day. Uh, that's roughly the median number. I'll show you in a second. The average number for American adults is closer to four, five hours a day, uh, which is just a stunning figure and I think shapes how we have to think about the evolution of the television experience. And then you guys actually were, were quite, quite close on the, uh, on the Super Bowl. So this year we got almost to 50% of U.S. households um, and something just shy of 15% of households for the Grammys. So still big unifying events that everybody turns out for even in this uh, day and age. So, so what would we take away from this? Um, the first thing I would take away is that this group is not a good representation of the U.S. consumer. And in general, you and your friends are not a good representatives of the U.S. consumer and their media habits. And you know, in a way, when I show you some numbers in a second, uh, thank God. The other thing which we should take away from this is that television viewing is neither down nor out. And in the face of lots of challenges and disruptions, uh, the core consumption behavior is actually remarkably resilient. Uh, and what I'd like to do in a couple slides here with a little bit of data is show you uh, that resilience and show you the places where we think the revolution actually is happening. So as threatened, as threatened, here are the average uh, usage statistics for American adults. The bottom two rows there are uh, men and women, 18 plus respectively. And you'll see here uh, two things I wanted to call out. More than five hours a day on average, uh, and the number is continuing to grow. Uh, five hours, just a stunning figure. It, it will take a lot of thinking to figure out how you fit that in. Um, one piece of color I would add is in our research, uh, we find that less than a quarter of that viewing is directed, destination, purposeful selecting of, of programming. Um, so an awful lot of that usage is background, entertain me, keep me company. Uh, the television is very much a part of our lives, even when we're not actively engaging with it. And I wanted to contrast those numbers, and this, this one goes out to the 5% of you who were so honest uh, earlier. Uh, those five hours is a stunning figure, and most people don't like to admit it. So what we're looking at here are two sets of numbers, um, both from Bernstein. And the underlying data set here is, is Nielsen, and it's a piece of research Ball State puts out uh, every few years, where they actually follow people around with a little diary and watch uh, all of their concurrent media exposure. Two things I wanted to call out. People vastly understate their personal television exposure. Uh, as I suggested, part of this, I think, is embarrassment about the number, and part of it actually is awareness. Uh, so much of that viewing is background, is keep me entertained, uh, keep me company. You may not know it. By the same token, people thus far, at least, are vastly overstating their use of some of the more emergent uh, video platform. So you see the, the statistics here on online video uh, where we have a uh, huge overstatement of how many people actually end up using that thing. So this is the part of the presentation where you're supposed to think I sound like a reactionary uh, and I'm going to here to tell you how the old guard is not going to change. Uh, and I assure you that's not actually what I'm doing. Um, geez, this is a little cryptic. Um, but the, <laughs> the underlying numbers here, here, it's a little... The underlying numbers here are online video usage, and there's, there's three different bars here. There's total time spent, that's the tallest bar that's had the, the largest growth. There's streams, tracks pretty closely to that, although stream length has been lengthening. That bottom bar is percent of the population regularly using online video. And what I would call out here is how unimpressive the growth of that is over this anonymous time frame. I think this is three years, we'll call it. Um, <laughs> And to make it more concrete, you know, this is still a niche behavior. Um, and here we're looking at figures from Nielsen uh, with the penetration of uh, online video viewing and then the total time spent. So as compared to that five hours a day of traditional television consumption, we're still talking on average five and six minutes a day um, of online video viewing. So what should we take away from this? Well, good news on this slide for content creators. Uh, and if, if uh, you bear with me a second, what we're looking at here is self-reported usage uh, of different video sources among four different populations. The far left is the overall television owners, those 98% of Americans with a television in the home. Uh, the one on the left are folks who only have a traditional television. Uh, they do, their television is not connected to the internet, either directly or using a buddy device, uh, and they don't have at home a, a tablet or an iPad. And what you can see is those folks actually watch a little bit less television uh, in total each day than average. 
The two other populations on the right are TVs with internet connectivity and uh, households with an iPad in the home. And what we wanted to point out here is that uh, these early findings suggest that, that the consumption taking place over those channels is actually additive uh, to core television consumption, uh, which if you happen to be a content owner is like the best news um, you will see all day. Um, not only is it additive, but by the way, the, the core television consumption, and I'm missing my legend here, but uh, this second from the top, uh, dark blue here, core television consumption across these groups is relatively flat. Um, so those five hours a day uh, are being added to, but they are not, in fact, under siege. The other statistic or trend you will have heard an awful lot about, and I, I don't pretend to be um, completely dispositive here, but here's the facts of what has gone on thus far, uh, cord cutting. So as I pulled the room here today, it looked like roughly 80% of you have a pay TV service at home. Uh, I told you the figure for the country as a whole is 90%. Um, and if you read the newspapers, or if you just read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, you'd think that number was plummeting uh, in favor of folks who are getting rid of their pay TV service and just running it all over their broadband. Um, some numbers here from Nielsen suggesting that's not yet the case, right? So the top bar is a uh, percentage of U.S. households who have cable and broadband, uh, and the bottom bar is percentage of U.S. households who only have broadband. And what you can see actually on this time frame is a substantial portion of the U.S. who are internet connected but not pay TV, but a substantial but flat portion, uh, so that 4% are just under. Um, and, and so we would talk about sort of structural or frictional uh, folks who are outside of the pay TV market, many of them are, are students or folks just entering the workforce. And at least in these numbers, we do not see uh, a massive move away from pay TV uh, yet. A little bit of a caveat here. Uh, if folks are not cutting the cord, uh, we feel quite strongly and our clients are starting to feel it on their P&L that folks are shaving the cord. Uh, and so two services up on the board here that are a premium services in their own right, bringing video on a paid basis into the home uh, and we are seeing huge impact from these services on uh, traditional pay TV providers on demand business as well as their premium business. Um, and so I, I am a Netflix household, an Apple TV household. I can't tell you the last time I downloaded a movie on demand from Time Warner. And, and that behavior, anecdotal in my case, is borne out in the data. You see it here and you see it in the P&Ls of those companies. And that's only going to get worse. Um, this is where uh, connected TVs, and again, apologies for the, uh, for the cryptic slide, but connected TVs are going to have a huge impact. So the numbers we're looking at on the left are the share of TV shipments in the U.S. each year, where the dark shaded portion are those which qualify as smart TVs, meaning both internet connected and extensible with downloadable applications. Uh, and what you see is in our work with the major OEMs, I think that second bar from the left is, is 2010. And the third bar is 2011. And so starting this year, the majority uh, of new models introduced will have this smart feature and functionality. And the result is what you see on the right, that household penetration of smart TVs is poised to skyrocket. So as those new models intersect the replacement cycle in consumers' homes, we believe that 70% of American homes will have at least one smart TV in them by 2015. Uh, and so that supplemental cord shaving behavior uh, which we talked about in the previous slide, will only get easier and easier to do. You know, at the same time, uh, time shifting continues to grow. Uh, and so what you see here are the penetration of DVRs uh, into American households. I would note the projection's actually been revised downward a couple times. Uh, and it, it's one of the effects of this, uh, these new over-the-top video services that um, some of the S-curve on DVRs has actually started to flatten out a little earlier than people thought. It's still a huge impact. So at 40 plus percent, uh, this is a big disruption in the, the core business of programmers and, and content owners. And at the same time, the, the underlying trend of the last 10 years continues unabated. And this, this, in my opinion, is the single biggest effect of these new distribution channels and new methods, is that the fragmentation, which has actually characterized media businesses now for at least a decade, uh, continues uh, to accelerate. So what you're looking on on the left-hand side is availability of channels in the average American home. That's the top bar and then the average self-reported number of channels watched. And what you see is huge growth in, in channels available in the home and relatively flat uh, figures on channels watched. And so the inexorable impact of that is a decline in the average ratings uh, of a cable channel. Uh, and that's been going on for quite some time. These other platforms will only serve to accelerate it uh, even if the, the core pay TV relationship uh, is a little bit more stable. 
that wasn't quite an Ignite presentation, but I was trying to get through that in five minutes. Uh, it wouldn't be a McKinsey presentation if I didn't talk a little bit about the implications here. I don't want to steal any thunder from the folks who are going to come later, but I couldn't resist talking about the implications for two groups of folks. Um, first, for content owners, I think I mentioned this earlier, but there's a really big piece of good news uh, in the emerging statistics, and the additivity of this consumption behavior uh, is huge news for content owners. Uh, personally, I think we all have experienced these moments where you find yourself watching a piece of video enabled by new technology in a situation where you wouldn't have had access to it before. So no, new use cases, new occasions, uh, growth in total viewing. And that, in the end, all else being equal, uh, should mean value creation for content owners. They have two, however, uh, big hurdles they have to get over to realize that uh, value creation. The first is managing the distribution shift. Uh, so as that viewing moves from one platform to another, it takes with it, or it leaves behind, rather, the economics that you're used to on those previous platforms. And so one of the core challenges we see for our clients who are content owners is managing that shift in a way uh, that both encourages it. If you're a content owner, more distribution is great. Uh, just like if you're making any product, more distribution means competitive distributors and it means incremental distribution. Uh, but it, you have to manage it in a way that you know, the business uh, is smooth throughout that, throughout that transition. You know, and then secondly, uh, the fragmentation pressure, which I mentioned earlier, which continues unabated. This, is not fundamentally about over-the-top video, but it's going to be accelerated by over-the-top video. Uh, and so the steps that content owners have been taking, changes to how they do programming, shifts in genre, um, you know, huge emphasis on efficiency and productivity in those organizations, they're only going to have to step up uh, those efforts in order to maintain the margins that they're used to. So that's half the story, and I think on balance, that's meant to be an, up, an upbeat story. Um, the other half of the story is maybe a little bit more challenging, although we can see our way to an upbeat answer here as well, and this is for the traditional distributors of video. Um, the good news here is that the control points, and I'll say a little bit more about what I mean, are holding for now. Uh, and so this cord cutting discussion, which has been so much in the news, you know, it is our perspective that that, that is holding for now. Uh, and those control points being, frankly, live sports, uh, ease of use, the four hours of television that folks watch every day, that is undirected uh, going on in the background and for which, frankly, a linear network programming grid is the absolute best thing that's ever happened. Those control points are holding for now. Uh, however, the innovation gap is widening. widening. This, again, has been going on for 20 years and uh, without insulting anybody in the room, I don't think it's, it's a surprise, but uh, again, widening and accelerating as these new players, these cloud-enabled services we've talked about are coming in with much shorter innovation cycles than the traditional guys can replicate. The traditional guys who are fundamentally facilities-based businesses with iron in the ground and in your home uh, and sitting on your set-top uh, are really going to be challenged to keep up with that innovation. And as that gap continues to widen, it will have pressure on ARPU. We'll continue to see uh, cord shaving. And ultimately, we will, unless we're careful, get to the good enough uh, alternative. And then lastly for these guys, the, the ripples of this behavior are starting to hit other parts of the business. So, the uh, clearest version of that came from one of the ISPs uh, a couple of weeks ago who announced that 25% of all the traffic on their network was Netflix streaming data. Um, and that, that is starting to drive real CapEx uh, as they're having to build out in the middle mile in order to support that. Um, I mentioned earlier the impact on revenue through things like uh, ARPU cord shaving premiums on demand. Um, so some real challenges uh, to overcome on both sides. but. You know, fundamentally, we would remain optimistic. That core stat that uh, consumption is going up, not down, um, is, the, is the heartening fact uh, for folks in the video business. Now, I have another version of the speech for folks in the newspaper business that's a little bit, uh, a little bit more dire, but uh, I'll save that one for another day. So, sit here or shall I go here? Hmm? Back down. So uh, with all of this technology that we have, we still haven't figured out PowerPoint to Mac conversions. So yeah. <laughs> two, less, two lessons there. Notice how smoothly the, the McKinsey consultant just dealt with that, right? Not, 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 not skipping a beat. And you know, duly noted that uh, there was some of the scales didn't come through. And I apologize for that. It looked fine last night, but there we go. All right, so next, um, that was very deftly handled. Uh, we have Karen, so she's going to kind of pick up where that left off and talk a little bit about 
what is ORPU and how is money made and what are all these platforms and, and where, where should we be thinking in terms of value chain? So. Great. Thank you, Tony. So on behalf of IBM, I want to thank you for um, having us here today. Um, I've been in the consulting business for roughly 12 years. The title Back to the Future made me think about the last time I was, I was here at Fuqua. It was for the NBA games. I did not attend Fuqua. I did come here for a weekend, though, and I, I think I'm still recovering from that weekend, actually. <laughs> um, but shortly thereafter, I joined PwC Consulting, um, focused on media and entertainment clients. And at that time, the question that you know, was asked from us more than anything was, what is this thing called e-business? And as a traditional media player, is there opportunity for me to put my business on the internet, and can I make money doing that? Well, fast forward to 12 years from now, and the fundamental question we're hearing from our media clients today is, what do you do when your products are as popular as ever, but consumers just don't want to pay for them anymore? So we're in a world where consumers are adopting you know, new online digital services at a faster pace than anyone previously anticipated. They're adopting smart devices, and it's consumers of all ages. It's, um, you know, it, it's not just the younger generation and the tech savvy anymore. The challenge that we have is consumers' anchor price has been set either at zero or very near to zero. And media companies are now trying to you know, struggle with this issue of how do we get consumers to pay for our quality content and information. New models have disrupted traditional business. And technology has been at the forefront of doing this. Whether it be piracy, whether it be consumer-generated content that many consider is good enough, whether it be what we lovingly call the reverse razor blade model, where companies like Apple used cheap, have used in the past cheap content almost as a dangling carrot in order to make money on the costly device. You know, the opposite of what um, Gillette did way back when, when it pioneered the razor blade model. And we see three primary issues that the industry has been facing um, and why you know, many in the traditional media business are now facing a situation where if you fast forward the trend several years, there could be a looming revenue gap, as we've seen with some, you know, some industries that have already been early casualties to what's happened in the digital era and this, this era of free. As you know, digital distribution is growing, it's for some not making up for the losses we're seeing in traditional media. And we think there's three primary issues that are actually happening here. One, substitution. So you know, we just heard from Mike that for some of the media segments, the ability to view um, content online has been additive, but that's not the case for every industry. Um, we also conduct primary research, um, and our research which suggests that for the 18 to 24 year old segment, those that are watching videos online are watching less traditional television as a result. When you think about the newspaper industry, the situation has been you know, a bit more complex. 60% um, suggest that they would like to turn to a digital source for real-time news and information. The challenge is less than 10% of those consumers are actually turning to an online newspaper site for that information. They're going to Facebook, they're going to Google, they're going to other sources. Two, the models online have been weaker to date. So in some cases, like newspaper, an online reader is estimated at 1 18th the value of a traditional print reader. That's because we completely lost the consumer paid pricing component and the advertising that we have had has been disrupted by technology. So ad networks you know, came in and were used to sell remnant inventory. The impact it had is it actually had a deflationary impact on the pricing. In the case of broadcast television, you know, we've all seen a lot you know, out there about, about Hulu and the impact it has had. Um, our estimates suggest uh, an online video viewer is estimated at roughly one-third the value. You know, the industry is taking strides to improve that, but you know, because though the advertising pricing is on par and in some cases superior because of the ability to target, there's just less inventory out there. And now we have to retrain the consumer to be willing to accept more advertising. Third issue we're facing is much broader ecosystem than we've ever had to deal with before. So in the past, media and entertainment companies worried about their competition, which was other media and entertainment companies. If you were NBC, you worried about CBS or ABC. If you were the New York Times, you worried about the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times. Now we're worrying about an entire ecosystem of participants that are all trying to establish direct relationships with the consumer. They're all leveraging technology to drive innovation 
and they're having dramatic impacts on what's happening to the value chain and what's occurred. So just some quick stats that I thought were interesting. You know, I think we're all familiar with some of the early casualties in the industry, but you know, if you think about the record labels, they saw revenue declines of 40% from their 2000 high. Newspapers have lost 85% of their classified revenues as consumers turn to search, social networks, um, free online classified sites. Physical DVD sales down an estimated 25% as consumers are opting for cheaper subscription-based online rental options and now streaming. Long-distance telecommunications revenue declined 80% in the first decade of the century. Consumers, um, before you know, they gave up their landlines, there was, for the telco industry, cord shaving. Um, consumers started shifting to their wireless phone where they could make phones, make calls cheaper, and they started shifting to services like Skype where it was much cheaper. So massive disruption, you know, very good understanding of, um, of the consequences that we've seen already. But we would actually argue consumers are spending money. They're just spending it in different ways. So when you look at the spend on media and entertainment communication, uh, media and entertainment, whether that be consumers spending directly on content, um, going to a movie, buying a newspaper, buying a magazine, buying a CD, um, downloading you know, television and paying for that, um, the content that's subsidized by advertisers, the money that is spent on distribution, whether that be through um, our subscription to our pay TV service, whether that be our access for fixed or mobile broadband, and the money that we've spent on associated devices, the good news is the overall pie has actually increased over the last five years. The challenge is the value has shifted away from the traditional media and content players, and it's primarily gone to the device manufacturers. You know, that's because we all um, are embracing connected devices. We have more devices than we've ever had in the past. So the challenge becomes, you know, what do you do in a situation like this, and how do you ensure you can capture value? If you look at a specific industry and do a deep dive, you can see how this has played out. And I know the music industry is, is an overplayed example of you know, what has happened and the casualties that can occur from digital transformation. But our analysis, again, would suggest that the overall industry did not have double-digit declines. You know, like many suggest, the traditional players, the record labels, the traditional retailers face double-digit declines. But the overall industry grew over the same time period roughly by 3%. It's just that the value shifted. Device manufacturers made a lot of money selling the MP3 players, the iPod, the iP iPad, the iPhone, the iTouch. Digital distributors did extremely well. The telcos got into the business and did quite well by um, distributing ringtones, components of music. Concert promoters did extremely well. Uh, consumers were gladly shelling out money so that they could see their musicians perform live. And even some of the retailers who had the foresight to realize, you know, this new era is kind of tricky. And some of the consumers don't quite know how to set things up in their homes. So let's establish in-home services. That's what Best Buy did with Geek Squad. Um, you know, a lot of their revenues was generated by um, you know, helping with the PCs and the technology, but a huge portion and an increasingly growing portion has been generated by helping consumers set up their in-home services. So you know, the lessons learned, the industry really needs to focus beyond content. Um, we, I actually um, am in the consulting arm of IBM, but I run our thought leadership practice now. So we've spent the last five years publishing studies around uh, how digital distribution is impacting the media and entertainment industry. We started with the end of advertising, end of television as we know it, then we published the end of advertising as we know it, then we decided we needed to get a little bit more uplifting. And we started uh, changing our titles to be less ominous, but we published Beyond Advertising, and most recently, Beyond Content. And what we talk about in that story is, you know, content is as important as it ever was. We're not suggesting that premium, high-quality content doesn't matter. But what is important to consumers as they're consuming that content, it now needs to also focus on the experience, the platforms, and the revenue models. And you know, the consumer needs to be put at the center of what's delivered. Data has become more important than ever, as we've heard numerous times throughout the day, in terms of understanding what consumers want, what they need, and how to deliver what, you know, those experiences on the right platforms with the right revenue models. So first, from an experience perspective, you know, this is an industry that historically has been really one size fits all. It's been mass market driven. Um, and in many ways, that was a much easier 
business model to pursue. Now we know that you know, it's a much more fragmented world. Consumers um, are gladly becoming more involved and more engaged in how they choose and select their content. They want more personalized experiences and they're willing to share information about themselves in order to get that personalized experiences. They want experiences that are more immersive, more interactive. They want experiences that are social. From a platform perspective, we need the devices to become connected. You know, we're seeing um, huge growth in mobile devices, tablets, PCs. The living room has really been the one area that is not connected yet. Um, once that becomes connected, consumers want the content to be harmonized. They want portability of content across those devices, and the business models need to be harmonized around that. And most importantly, to drive adoption, it needs to be easy. So when you think about who's really you know, adopted the smart devices already, and the ones that were the early adopters, they were the ones that didn't mind you know, figuring out how to set up their in-home entertainment systems. They were the ones who you know, embraced technology and loved it. But you know, think about, I think about my parents, um, you know, think about yours, and my parents until very recently still had a VCR and it was still flashing 12 o'clock in red because they never learned how to fix that and they had no desire or interest to learn how to fix that. Yeah, so in the living room, um, you know, right now we've got the ability to have connectivity but it's, it's really a me too device right now. It's not on the television and you know, Mike just talked about some of the, the forecasts. We're getting there but we're not there yet. And finally from a revenue model perspective, there needs to be innovation here. So the pricing models, they need to be flexible for the consumers. Um, you know, we also conduct our, our own primary consumer research and what we've heard from the consumers loud and clear is, I want to be able to have the option of bundled versus a la carte. I want to be able to have the option of buying versus renting. I want to be able to have the option of doing a one-time purchase versus having a subscription. I want to be able to have the option of paying for content versus having that content be ad supported. And there is a you know, sizable segment that is willing to pay for the content. The question is how do, you, how do you find them and how do you target them? The advertising and the marketing needs to become more relevant to individual consumers' you know, choices, preferences, and needs. Um, it needs to become more targeted. It needs to become more integrated across all of these devices and platforms. And there's a notion, you know, as we can leverage data and the, con and the understanding of the context of what a consumer is doing, we've evolved from mass market advertising to real-time advertising. With the mobile devices, location-based services, we're quickly getting to the point of right-time advertising, and there's going to be real value in delivering that. And last, the experiences and the revenue models need to be value-based. So if you think about the fact that we're shifting to a world where experiences are much more personalized, they're much more immersive, there are all sorts of new ways that companies can repackage their products and their information now that they're digitized to create new types of experiences and deliver enhanced value. So you know, again, think about the music industry. The cost of an album, $12.99. The cost of an individual song, 99 cents. The cost of a ringtone, $2.99. So consumers saw more value in a piece of content than they did in the overall bundle. And you know, that's the exciting thing about you know, this digital era is it offers our clients um, and you know, companies within the media and entertainment industry all sorts of new ways to reach and respond to the consumer. And when we think about you know, what's happening with this, um, this digital era transformation, um, you know, we believe it's a really exciting time for the media and, and entertainment industries. Um, you know, we're really just at the onset of delivering against this personal, immersive, and social experience. You know, for the most part, most companies have focused on getting their content out, with, out there. We've got the distribution out there, we're on a number of different channels, but we haven't really made the experience all that interactive yet. I mean, there's a lot of experimentation, there's a lot of innovation that's happening with social technologies, with mobile apps, but it's very much been complementary to the core product. Um, you know, I think in the next three, five years time, we're going to see that those, that level of interactivity and immersion is going to become fundamentally central to the product. And I think it's a very exciting time for you, know, you as students to be entering this industry and, and thinking about how you can transform the industry. So last thing I wanted to cover is, you know, as part of IBM, um, we spend a lot of time thinking about technologies. Um, in addition to the question that, you know, we hear around 
what do we do to monetize our content, we've had a number of clients you know, who come to us and increasingly they're coming to us to say how can we leverage technologies to drive innovation. Um, and it's, it's, you know, for me personally, it's been very interesting and it's been an exciting opportunity to work at IBM given the you know, breadth and strength of our research arm to start to have those types of conversations around how technology can really drive innovation into an industry that you know, wasn't, it was not the central or um, core focus in the past. So I just wanted to leave with um, you know, a few sort of sets of technologies that you know, we think are important to watch um, and we think will become increasingly important going forward. Um, I'm not going to lay out a crystal ball of you know, what we imagine will happen, but I will you know, call out a few scenarios of how these technologies can be leveraged for the industry. So you know, first one, um, mobile spectrum, intelligent devices, really cloud computing. You know, the notion that this debate around the PC, the TV, the mobile device, we just don't think that's going to matter anymore. Um, with the rollout of 4G, it's a really exciting time on mobile devices, especially when you think about video and the fact that you know, we can now get high def video, we can start to get 3D, we can get augmented reality already. When you, you know, factor in the fact that um, devices are becoming more intelligent and with smart TVs in the living room, we're going to get to the point where we have a tipping point where we have all three devices that are intelligent and can start to speak to one another. And when cloud computing models become more mature, even the most immersive type of media and entertainment content, which has historically been you know, console-based video games, can suddenly be delivered to any device. Next one, analytics. So we've heard a lot about data. We've heard a lot about how data has become central to what this industry needs to do, how we need to get closer to our customer, how do we need to respond to our consumer, how do we need to deliver those personal information, personal experiences. But we also think analytics can help make the experience easier and can help drive adoption. So has anybody in the room been watching Jeopardy the last two nights? Okay, so um, you know, really exciting time. We've had Watson competing against two of the biggest Jeopardy um, winners of all time. Um, I was actually just on, a, I was surfing on my iPhone and I saw an AOL headline that said Watson kits, kicks human butt. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. But that was not, you know, that's not the intention of Watson. Watson, I think, provides a glimpse of what's to come in the future and how technology can really be used to drive simplicity and to help enhance the experience, especially when you think about media and entertainment. So what Watson is, it's a deep QA system. It's able to provide um, human level responses based on questions that it, it pulls from vast amounts of data. So when I think about its applicability perhaps in the living room and how it can be used for interactive television. So you know, the, the promise of interactive TV today is I'm watching Friends and I like a sweater that Jennifer Aniston is wearing and I'm able to search and figure out you know, who makes that sweater and then find out where I can buy that sweater. Well, what if I could just turn to my TV and ask the question or ask it through my Xbox Connect and say, who makes that sweater, for, that sweater Jennifer is wearing? In the same way I might turn to my husband, my roommate, whoever it might be, on, on the couch next to me and ask that question. And, and what if the system can actually pull up for me information about who makes the sweater, where I can buy it, it can give me the price comparisons, it can tell me you know, what the different color options are and I can purchase it right then and there. So again, you know, driving a level of simplicity into the experience that can help make these experiences much more personal, much more immersive. Social technologies, we've heard a lot about social technologies and how they're, going to, how they're being leveraged um, both within um, an enterprise, how they're going to be leveraged within, an in, within the industry. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but you know, again, if you think about media and entertainment segments, social media has very much been complementary to the product itself. You know, once we get to a point where we have mass adoption around connected devices and they're able to speak you know, more uh, intelligently to one another, social really has the potential to transform the entire media and entertainment value chain. So citizen journalism has become popular already. already. You know, think about um, the impact it can have on production for sports programming, as an example, and the ability to link 10,000 sports fans who are sitting in a stadium 
to the fans that are watching on their television device at home. And you know, the fact that those 10,000 sports fans have a mobile device in their hands, they can take a shot, they can upload a piece of video, and that can be disseminated to everyone who's sitting and watching remotely. And finally, wanted to leave with just um, the notion of instrumentation and gaming. So um, you know, we talked about Farmville and how successful that has been in really driving new segments of consumers who have suddenly become passionate about online gaming, playing games with one another. Um, the competencies that you know, Zanga really has in terms of leveraging data, understanding consumer behavior, and targeting to that consumer. You know, we think that as other media and entertainment content segments become more immersive, more interactive, they're going to start to have to borrow you know, much of the skill sets that we're seeing um, happening within the gaming industry. And when the world becomes more instrumented, so when more things are sensor-based so that we can start to have truly immersive experiences, um, experiences that rival you know, video games with 3D, with augmented reality, with things like virtual reality, the possibilities of what media and entertainment companies can deliver to consumers really become you know, near endless. And rather than being a content owner, you're really a data rights owner. And suddenly you have all sorts of permutations in terms of how you can package up that information, how you can deliver it to a consumer to add value, and how you can negotiate you know, partnerships across the value chain. So you know, again, the combination of these technologies, we think, is going to drive a near limitless set of opportunities for the media and entertainment industry. It's going to deliver truly converged experiences. There'll be smarter experiences. There'll be socially connected experiences. And they will be immersive experiences. You know, the question that, that we're really interested in now is how is the ecosystem going to reconfigure to respond to this? Who is going to respond and drive the innovation? And how, are, how is the value going to shift? Thank you. Thank you, Karen. That was fantastic. And, and, and the question is, where is it going and how is it going to shift? And, and thankfully, um, Howard has been looking at that and is going to give us some, some insight up to 2014. You're still in the middle of the 2015, if I got that right. right. Yep. right. Okay. Howard Homan of PwC. Do you have a click, the uh, clicker here? Karen, do you the There we are. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I am uh, very happy to be here today, and uh, also a shout out, I believe, to my parents. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, we will be establishing a chatter uh, setup for all the parents watching their children that are presenting today. So I think there really is a tremendous business development opportunity there. Um, uh, I, to, keeping a little bit with the theme of, of starting off and, and uh, for, the, for the students, particularly in the audience, and, and where, how do we get here, what was our background, and you know, in the materials you can see my, uh, my uh, background. I have a somewhat eclectic one. I began my career in politics, actually, uh, to give you somewhat of a sense of my age. Uh, when I was the counsel to the House Telecommunications and Finance Subcommittee, Democrats and Republicans used to work together on legislation, I mean, it's, uh, it's almost prehistoric. Um, uh, and then um, the, the one part, though, in, of, of my career uh, that was left out, um, you know, we have to have a certain space limitations, was that, um, and it's a, it's a whole part of the ecosystem that I don't think people have focused on enough today, is, is that I did spend time attempting to be a working actor. Uh, and uh, two real, uh, great lessons for you, uh, for those of you in the, in the crowd that may be thinking maybe that's an option for you, you know, in your future career, are one, uh, define your brand appropriately. Uh, and I would suggest that being the tall uh, New York Jewish leading man might be a somewhat limited brand um, in, in your future acting career. Uh, you know, uh, there are some wonderful opportunities, but they are somewhat limited. Um, uh, Shakespeare wrote very little uh, for that particular group, <laughs> as for, for example. Um, and, and the other was just looking at it in a pure dollars and cents analysis, and, and John uh, you know, uh, will understand in, in terms of using the, the benefits of, of uh, quants and, and rigorous uh, uh, analytics. Uh, looking back, uh, I would say that my, um, uh, that my uh, peak income uh, in that particular field was, uh, was in the mid five figures. 
uh, and really, unfortunately, only three of those figures came in front of the decimal point. So, it, it, I, it, it, which, which really leads me to where I am today. Uh, so, uh, what, what we want to talk about is uh, what PwC uh, does and, and has done. Well, that's not the right button here. Uh, there we are. Um, uh, what we have uh, released for the last 11 years is a look ahead at uh, the world of entertainment and media, looking at the entire world, uh, dividing the world into four regions, uh, North America, Latin America, uh, Asia Pacific, and what we call EMEA, uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, uh, taking uh, uh, the industry and dividing it into 12 different segments, and really trying to, on a very comprehensive data-driven basis, we put our, this publication, again, sort of uh, maybe you, you wouldn't think of it as your traditional participation in the entertainment and media business, but this is done by real people doing real data analysis uh, and drawing data in from literally all over the world to provide a picture of not just today, but really looking ahead. And, and it's sort of gratifying in many cases to see when you go visit a client and you see sitting on their desk somebody who's a head of strategy or M&A, a CFO, people who really need to be uh, having a sense of where they ought to be investing, what kinds of, uh, uh, where their best growth opportunities might lie in their own business or in, uh, in those they might be looking at, is to see a dog-eared copy of, of Outlook sitting on somebody's desk. So it's work that, is, uh, that a lot of people, it, it's a year-long process. We release, uh, we release it in June of each year, uh, as we will this year, and they work on uh, what will be coming out in June, obviously, is 2011 through 15, uh, and then 15 minutes after that gets released, uh, all of the work begins uh, on the next year. Uh, and so uh, it's sort of like the uh, Tournament of Roses parade, I think. You know, they, they start working on the floats uh, immediately. Um, so it's, a, it, it's, a, it's an extremely uh, uh, kind of valuable well-read document that we could use uh, a lot of help uh, to continue to publish. So uh, let's look at, uh, this is kind of the, the uh, uh, overview of, of where we see, and I, I think some, some of the themes that you may see emerging are similar really to what, what Michael and I think Karen were saying in terms of, uh, in terms of where the future is. And, and I'll, I'll just point to maybe the most important point on the entire chart, which is right there, which is that in 2014, there will actually be an entertainment and media business. <laughs> now, you may read uh, in many cases that between over the top and free content and, and piracy, et cetera, that um, well, th this, you know, it's, it's dead. Who, who's going to, you know, no one watches television except for the three people here, uh, apparently. Uh, you know, nobody buys anything, uh, and, and really it's a world that will just uh, wither away and die. Uh, not, uh, not true. Uh, so that's the, the, the best news here. Uh, 2009, uh, there's a kind of a scary year, and I think we, all, we can all, in our own private way, uh, recognize the, the challenges that, that we've just come through and are not entirely through. Um, but, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the cautionary notes going forward is advertising tends to be a leading indicator. Uh, Usually, historically, it has been that people put their companies put their money into advertising ahead of the growth cycle because they want to get that they want to be marketing their goods and services as consumers are coming available to purchase. Uh, if you're looking ahead, you see actually advertising uh, really falling a bit behind the overall level of growth. So again, I think that reflects, and we see it in our economy today, a certain caution about. Uh, about some of these investments. So here's, a, here's kind of our, uh, um, our, our version of, of Google Map, right? So here's the world and, and uh, oh, I'm so, sorry, uh, and, and, uh, and looking ahead, overall, um, we see a, uh, and I don't know if we have our overall number, but I think overall we have a roughly 5% uh, compounded uh, annual growth rate for the world for entertainment and media, but it's obviously not a flat picture. And you see areas of the world, in fact, North America 
is the smallest percentage of growth in the world. So you have many companies, John Sabino, many others uh, well familiar with this, about the, the increasing uh, importance of international markets. And um, you know, Latin America at 8.8%, Brazil, for example, look at a couple of events coming up just in the next couple of years, a World Cup in 2014, an Olympics in 2016, parts of the world that had, that had been clearly viewed as, from a business perspective in the backwater, coming more and more to the front. Uh, Saudi Arabia and, and Pan-Arab, uh, this was done before Egypt. Uh, we, we do take into account geopolitical forces, but, um, but my, my guess is that nothing we have seen uh, as, as dramatic as they are in a political sense is going to, is, is going to stop the progress of the growth of media, um, particularly in areas that had previously lagged behind. So um, here we break it down. These are the, these are the segments uh, of, the, um, of the media marketplace. Uh, one of the, uh, and, and I, you know, I don't need to read all the numbers to you. I mean, one of the, you know, obviously we're down here in the, in, in the newspaper world, a less than, you know, uh, a far less uh, pic uh, exciting picture going forward than in the internet advertising world, in video games, et cetera, internet access. Uh, newspaper publishing is, you know, there's not a new story there. Uh, I, another, a uh, piece of my background is I ran a graduate program for a couple of years in television management at Drexel University in Philadelphia, um, and, uh, and uh, nowhere near the, uh, 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 the uh, basketball uh, prowess, I might add, of course, of where I am today. But, um, but nevertheless, a, a fine institution. And, uh, and my, the greatest thing about teaching, actually, was having my own focus group amongst the students. Uh, and, uh, and this is several years back. and, and, and uh, and seeing the students just look at me with, with uh, disbelief about the notion that I would wake up on a frigid, cold morning, put slippers and a bathrobe on, and walk outside to my front uh, driveway, pick up these, these plastic-wrapped pieces of paper, trudge back into my house, throw away the plastic, and then sit down you know, and, and begin to consume my news in that fashion. Said, you know, looked at me, um, again, with, with, with disbelief. Clearly, um, I, I guess this is, a, this is maybe good news um, in some respect, in that it isn't a projection that it will uh, be gone in five years, uh, that, that, the, you know, that, the, that the, the center is holding to a degree, and the worst is, you know, we are in the midst of the worst as opposed to um, you know, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the, the end coming quite so quickly, but it's obviously a, a, mixed, a mixed picture there. Um, in the U.S., uh, a more, you know, s similar trends, but different, you know, particular categories. Again, uh, newspapers in the states, as opposed to other parts of the world, um, is actually a more troubled story than it is uh, throughout the world. Uh, one of the obvious and, and uh, not necessarily news themes is uh, access to the internet uh, becoming increasingly important is the, is the payment for internet access itself. Uh, that advertising, taking a somewhat smaller piece of the pie going forward, may be reflected in the opportunities for more subscription services, uh, whether it's Netflix or Hulu or, or whatever it may be, where there are opportunities, non-advertising media opportunities, we would expect to, to be a, a, a greater de uh, piece of the pie five years from now. Uh, it may be, uh, I don't know if you can see the differentiation in the colors uh, clearly enough. Um, again, I would point to one of the interesting things here. We're, we're talking about five years in the future. We have television. Excluding mobile and online at 36%, uh, they accounted for that globally in 2009. By 2014, we have them at 37%. So television, while they're only the, these three people who watch television in this room are driving the entire global economy. It's really phenomenal. Um, but the fact is that, that, again, even in a world of so many changes and so many opportunities, we see that innovation will come to television as well as to other parts of the media world. 
the, the revenues will not be generated all in the same way, by all the same people, in all the same fashion, but there are opportunities and there are abilities, for example, in that business to take advantage of the scale that exists. If, if you want to assemble 100 million people watching an event, it's going to be the Super Bowl and it's going to be on broadcast television. If it's 20 million plus people at one moment in time watching a program, it's likely to be an American Idol or a Grammy Awards or something like that on broadcast television, at least in the US. Um, and, and globally as well, the growth opportunities, we think, uh, remain, remain there. Uh, in the, uh, how do you, taking sort of one slice, consumers and where are they likely to be spending their money? Video games, uh, you know, as, as, as Karen talked about in her presentation, certainly we see as the greatest single area uh, where consumers we expect will be spending, uh, will be spending much more uh, as a percentage of, of their, their money going forward. Um, the overall contribution of the uh, digital uh, marketplace, you can see we're back in 2005, it was 12% it was contribution to the overall growth in the media business. By 2014, we're looking at a full third of the growth. Not necessarily a full, a third of revenues, but a third of growth, and of course, for you especially, you want to be looking at what's growing, where, where is it growing. Uh, just a couple of, from the numbers, what are, what are, these, what are, what are the numbers telling us? Uh, let me ask a question. How many people in this room have an iPad? Okay. How many people in this room had an iPad one year ago? Trick question. <laughs> there was no iPad one year ago. Did not exist. It existed it, it, within Apple headquarters. There were no consumers who owned an iPad one year ago. April 3rd, 2010, the launch of the iPad. So only one year later, the importance we, we see in the mobile device world, look at what we've seen. The iPad, tablets from Samsung, HP, Dell. You know, di different solutions being put out there. Smaller tablets, um, uh, open platforms as opposed to the Apple closed model. Verizon now has the iPhone. Uh, so, you know, again, things that seemed so far off and, and not literally a part of the conversation only a year ago uh, are now, one year later, very much a part of that. We think that that, that kind of innovation, uh, that kind of, um, of uh, centrality for media going forward is, is obviously only going to continue. Uh, the, uh, the growing dominance of the internet experience and that is really cuts across every fashion of the media and entertainment business. Uh, for those of you who have, um, uh, and, and it may be some of the folks in this room, but also for those who have uh, teenage daughters, I can tell you that, that the notion of using a telephone as a means of voice communications from one person to another seems so utterly old fashioned. I was looking at, and I think it was, it was Karen had a reference to long distance telephone service. I, I mean, you know, I don't know that my kids would understand what that term meant, uh, never mind actually use it. Uh, and so, you know, my daughter now, uh, my older daughter, when she wants to find out what the homework assignment is, will post on Facebook. Um, that, that she needs help figuring out, you know, wh which chapter we're supposed to read. I said, and, you know, five minutes go by, she says, nobody's responded. W w you know, nobody's responded. I said, why don't you call someone and ask what the, what's the, oh, you just saw Gloria two hours ago. Can't you call Gloria and say, what, what's the homework? Said, Dad, pl no, Dad, please, nobody calls. So, anyway, the internet experience, central. Uh, uh, Increasing engagement and readiness to pay for content. Again, as we were talking about this, as a, you know, advertising um, will continue to be a growing part of the business, but increasingly we, consumers for the right experience, the right level of convenience, the right, the right match between their needs and their desires uh, and, and, the, and the, the content that they want to consume, they will, they will, we will increasingly see opportunities uh, for them to pay for that. Uh, 
This, I'm just going to do this very quickly. Prerequisites for success, and we've been talking about that. Uh, we all have our, our needs to, uh, to fit in in the value chain and provide value to our employer, to our clients, uh, to our bosses, uh, whoever it might be. Uh, we all, uh, all the companies that we work with and for uh, have the same, the same needs. Uh, some of the keys, and, and they tie together with some of the things we've been hearing today, the need for strategic flexibility. Your business today, however good it is, is not what your business is going to be uh, in 2014. Uh, it will be, it may, our projections show a growing opportunity in this sector. They don't show it's the same, it's the same thing that's being done that's grown at X percent. It's, it's a different world. Uh, continued engagement directly with the consumer, listening to the consumer, re being responsive to the consumer. Uh, economies of scale and scope uh, is not a new story, but one that, that will obviously continue to be uh, an important theme. Uh, the speed of decision making, you can tie that pretty closely to the need to be flexible and the need to act uh, in, in a quick fashion. Agility and ta talent management and bringing in people, you know, in the entertainment world, the importance of research, data, uh, and, and analysis is incredibly important. And that will really be, the winners will be determined by, I would argue, uh, I don't think John is saying differently, uh, good content is still pretty important to all of that. Uh, but taking that, taking that data and learning from what your customers are telling you about it is really central. And, and that MBA, as opposed to uh, perhaps the, uh, the niche acting uh, perspective is, is going to be uh, well served in the future. Uh, the ability to monetize brands and, and rights across platforms, I just want to focus a second on the rights piece of that, that, that simply the notion of simply taking, uh, if you're a major content owner and sending everything to a different platform is a enormously complicated, lengthy process involving a long, legacy deals, you know, when I was at NBC and negotiated content distribution deals, we did them for six, eight, ten years out. You can imagine trying to figure out the penetration of the HDTV marketplace about five years before HDTV existed. So um, it, it's, it's uh, people in that, when you're an, an IP owner, you need to know your rights, you need to, you need to have the information about them and be able to, to, be able to shift and, and have your rights reflect what your future business needs are. Um, and lastly, strong capabilities and partnership structuring. In this, you know, an increasingly complex world, um, it's very difficult for anybody to do everything they need to do, uh, or maybe anything they need to do on their own. You need good partners. And oftentimes, I can't tell you how many conversations I have with clients, and, and they'll talk about a meeting they had, and I say, well, b between, these two companies, well, were, were, you, were you talking as competitors or as partners? Uh, well, sort of both. And, and that's really, you know, what is Hulu, okay? Two companies that, three, News Corp, NBCU, Fox, beat each other's, uh, I mean, uh, Disney, sorry, beat each other's brains out every single minute of every single day in the media that they, that they uh, are immersed in. They're partners in Hulu. They came together to see the value of, of a strategic shift in the way they distribute content. That's only going to continue. And that's it. And uh, I, uh, I, I know from, from past experience, there are two death spots in the world of, uh, of summits like this. One is right before cocktails. Uh, one is right before lunch. So thank you all for indulging me in the uh, pre-lunch spot. What about we just take five minutes for your questions? I won't ask any questions, but there was a lot of content covered here. There's a saying in Ireland, if you're not confused, you don't understand. Um, and I think what we just got presented here was a lot of information. So let's, let's just see if there's some questions for the panel, but we'll keep it to five minutes so we can, get, we can get to lunch. If I could invite you all up. So Mike, Karen, Howard. Questions for the panel. TV's not going away. Um, <laughs> models are going to shift. Harmonizing platforms is important. What does an MBA audience want to know? Hi. Uh, my name's Chad here, so I'm a first year here at uh, Business School. Just had a question. You guys all kind of spoke about, you know, fairly optimistically about the industry and that it's still growth, um, but it's starting to become, become a little bit more spread out in the overall ecosystem of media and entertainment. It's starting to look a lot larger 
and going into, into other areas. Just want to know, just from speaking with clients, what are some of the ideas that you see them experimenting with and you know, really kind of asking you guys if these business models make sense? Um, I'm kind of thinking maybe this is somewhat outside of their more traditional uh, you know, areas and, and divisions that they've been into. So just curious to see what they're trying to uh, explore with. Yeah, I, I, I can start. Um, you know, we hear our clients um, thinking about ideas that, it, you know, it's kind of easy to play Monday morning quarterback, um, even if you look at the music industry and what they could have done perhaps differently. Um, they could have focused on a direct-to-consumer offering, which they you know, really didn't look at at the time. They could have leveraged social media and social technologies in a much more compelling way to make m music more viral. Um, you know, think about Vivo and what's happened there. They could have leveraged analytics to deliver value. Um, you know, if you think about the knowledge that the record labels have about consumers and their passion for music, and how telling a consumer's passion for music is about their tastes and preferences and connecting that consumer with third parties who perhaps want to reach the consumer. There was a lot of value that, you know, that was left on the table and perhaps could have been you know, focused on. The other area that um, we have clients talking about is how can I extend my value across the value chain? So, you know, if you buy into the notion that um, you know, I, I can no longer just look at my traditional siloed industry, I need to be thinking more broadly, then how do I extend, how do I become a hardware provider that is now in the services business? You know, when you look at what um, Microsoft Xbox has done, you know, they have managed to create a relationship with a consumer where they're paying on an ongoing basis for the opportunity to connect, download games, um, have live viewing parties you know, through their partnership with ESPN. When you think about um, the magazine industry, they've done a similar focus. Um, so Meredith Corporation is a very good example of a traditional magazine publisher who sought to diversify their revenues. They took the knowledge that they have about consumers and the understanding and they made a number of acquisitions in the interactive marketing space. And they're now a major player. They work directly with advertisers. They've bypassed traditional agencies in many ways to create campaigns both for their own magazines but also elsewhere. Others? Uh, one I might add quickly to the pile is the iTunes model. I can't tell you how many clients I have asking me how to make the iTunes model work for their content. In many cases, this is because they're actually talking to Steve Jobs and he's getting them really excited about make it easy, make it cheap. Um, and you should see folks when they come back from those meetings, their eyes are lit up and they feel like, you know, frankly, they've been to the mountain. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's a lot of excitement there. It's tough when you run the numbers. And so it, it very much remains to be seen what that model does for content um, as opposed to for the device makers in the, this reverse razor blade kind of world. Uh, you know, I, I think that... Um, uh, one of the things that's interesting is is that it, now that the, having seen the music industry go through what it's gone through, it's become the poster child for what not to be. So I think that even for traditional kind of hidebound companies, uh, there is a, even, even if there's a fear factor about going into the unknown, there's a greater fear factor of I don't want to be the music industry. Mm -hmm. And you know maybe that's unfair in some respects, but it's. It, you know, it really is a, a uh, I mean, it, it reminds me of, I have one of my closest friends from law school started an independent record label. Um, and for those of you who have kids, it's, uh, the, their main product is called Kids Bop, um, and it's uh, called Razor and Time Music. And, and Cliff was interviewed not that long ago in some, some industry publication, and they asked him, well, what's the difference sort of between what you do as this small niche independent record label versus the big labels? He said, well, we're still in the music business. <laughs> so, um, you know, and again, that's somebody who just had, had to redefine, but he could more quickly, more in, in a much more agile fashion, redefine what he was doing to still be, a, you know, relevant and, and, and make money in the music business. Others are catching up, but, um, but I think there is a, a again, a, across the board, a knowledge that, they, that people have to innovate. They have no, they have no choice but to experiment. Others, back here. Hi, my name's Matt, I'm a first year as well. Uh, Michael, you just touched on this a little bit, but um, Karen, when you, you talked about um, the, the value shifting away from content, um, whether it's to devices or wherever it might go, 
Uh, what does that mean for content creators whose uh, content is getting more expensive to produce? Um, so film studios, you know, the cost of making movies is, is really rising. And, you know, if the value is shifting away from content, how is that going to change content itself going forward? And I think you know, that's a real risk. Um, if the industry can't figure out how to monetize the content, then there is a risk that the quality of the content will diminish. And you know, we as consumers won't get that same level. And, you know, the good news is technology innovation continu continues to bring down the cost of producing things, including content. Um, you know, I think Hollywood as an industry, I'm sure you'll hear you know, more about this this afternoon, but you know, I think as an industry is starting to think about how do we drive efficiency into our development process. But you know, on, on the other side, in terms of how do we enable consumers to want to pay for content and see the value in that, you know, I, I think it's um, a lot of the themes that I had touched upon. You know, one, create a compelling experience um, that's unique to the consumer, that's unique to the, the platform that they're on, so that they'd prefer to pay a little bit extra for you know the whether it be exclusive rights to you know, specific type of content that they can't get through Netflix, as an example, um, give them the choice in terms of how they're going to pay. Um, you know, companies like Spotify, companies like OnLive in the gaming industry, I think are doing some really interesting you know, concepts in terms of offering a, a menu, in terms of how consumers can choose to have a relationship with them. Anyone else? I'll take one more question before lunch. I think this is really directed more at Karen and IBM after watching Jeopardy last night. <laughs> There's a local company called Evo App, who, and I'm going to just read off their website. Inte they have an intelligence engine that computes dozens of dimensions, including sentiment, passion, volume, response time, and more. What dimensions are you tracking? They track mostly social media things to give similar information. I see a lot of hard numbers on hardware and other things that have been traditionally tracked. Do you track things like this with other devices such as Watson? That is a question I would probably have to direct you to our IBM research group. Um, I, I just wouldn't want to misspeak on what capabilities Watson has and, and does not have. Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, the, the last question was really teeing it up, and I was looking down here at, at the next session because this whole notion of the cost of movie making uh, and where that's going, and then the challenge that you have in kind of monetizing it is precisely what we'll be talking about after lunch. So that question was a great layup. Uh, the, the money is moving immediately from my near proximity phone into your bank account. I haven't teed <laughs> that up so well. Uh, so lunch is in the winter room, just where we had it before. And if we could be back here, I'm going to try and get us back on track in 45 minutes. If we could be back here at uh, 1.30, we'll start with the next session. Thank you all for a very productive morning. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.